Hey, welcome to the Content Lifecycle Management, New Approaches in Patch Management. My name is Rain Curtis. I'm a uh, Principal Architect for North America uh, Services, and uh, I'll be presenting here with Dario. Dario, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm Dario Lady. Uh, I'm located in Italy. Uh, I'm a system manager developer, um, and I take care uh, about the usability side uh, of the product and uh, a lot of front-end and UI stuff. All right. Well, uh, in this session, we want to talk about what content lifecycle is, um, how we can use it, what was the need for it, um, well, what are the different components uh, with this feature that's been put into SUSE Manager uh, since uh, SUSE Manager 4.0. Um, how do we set it up and uh, what, what are the requirements for each one of those? Uh, then we'll take it some time and we'll look at it and, uh, and see how it actually works. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit of, uh, in our conclusion about strategies for management. So when we look at content lifecycle management, um, the first thing we want to think about is stability. When we look at the stability of our environments, one of the key factors is how do we implement updates to that environment? Uh, SUSE Manager uh, checks in with SUSE and the repositories on a nightly basis. So that means you could patch your servers and they could report that they're all patched, but then the next morning it will show that they're not patched if your systems are subscribing directly to those channels. Um, not only can the reporting maybe be um, a little uncertain in reporting to management and they might be wondering, hey, why are your servers never patched? Uh, because they're always getting updates. But it also can cause some, some instability because you're not formally promoting packages and going through a formal change control process. Um, content lifecycle management allows you to establish uh, the life cycle of how these updates are introduced to your environment. So what is content lifecycle management? Well, if we look at the perspective of the managed systems, uh, they work in the aspect of repositories and uh, that's where they're getting their updates. SUSE Manager can manage those repositories. So when we talk about content lifecycle management, what we're talking about in SUSE Manager terms are the channel sets that represent those repositories. Content lifecycle management allows us to define these channel sets based on the environments that we have in our uh, enterprise. It allows us to promote sequentially through those environments so that we can control and promote when we need to. It also allows us to get accurate reporting uh, at any given time uh, when we need to uh, uh, determine what systems are patched, which ones are not. It also allows us to manage these. So we might promote multiple times into like a sandbox or a dev environment, um, but after through maybe many iterations, we would promote into production, and maybe that's on a quarterly basis. So when we look at these content lifecycle uh, channels, we, one way to think about them is that these channel sets that are created through uh, content lifecycle are uh, snapshots, a moment in time based on specific criteria that we can define that we want each one of our managed systems to have. So what does that look like? If we were to kind of just look at this conceptually, um, we're going to have a source channel. And from that source channel, uh, that's the one that's getting updated uh, nightly in our environments. Those patches, when we're ready, can now be controlled and promoted into a sandbox or to a dev environment, as it shows on the screen. Uh, from there, we can, you know, that that's, would be our most unstable environment, and that environment allows us to uh, continually promote as needed. Only when we're ready, can we, we can promote from dev into test and into that channel set. Uh, that could be testing, that could be user acceptance. Uh, from there, uh, pre-production. When those things are certified and ready to go, only then would we promote those updates into our production channel set. So now, once again, we see that, that we have that sequential promotion of updates 
from one environment to the next as needed in our each of our environments. So when we talk about the components of uh, content lifecycle management, uh, on the screen you see at a high level, this is what needs to be defined. So let's talk about the project. Uh, within content lifecycle, we'll have a project for each one of our distributions that we will be managing. When we look at a project, we want to look at uh, specifically what naming convention do we want to use. We want something that's descriptive that shows what this project is managing. However, we don't want it to be too long because when we talk about management, and maybe we'll go to the command line uh, and do certain operations, we don't want it too long. As well as sometimes, uh, and in certain situations, names within the user interface might get long. So when you're choosing the names of your project, consider uh, something that's descriptive but not too verbose in your environment. Once we've defined that project, we'll continue to define the sources, fil filters, and environments. Uh, also, it's important to note that these projects uh, and uh, uh, the updates into them will be auto-incremented, um, which is a really nice feature for being able to keep track of what versions each one has. Uh, I will be showing you an example of that as we go throughout this presentation. So first of all, let's talk about the sources. Where are we going to get our updates? Well, uh, one of the nice features of Content Lifecycle is we can define multiple sources. Now, I would advise that even though we can define multiple sources, we don't necessarily uh, want to. Uh, your best practice will be to keep it simple. For example, if you're looking at SLES 15 SP1, then keep it with SLES 15 SP1 unless there is a compelling reason to have another repository. Typically, within SUSE Manager, if we are going to have additional repositories, we would add that as a child channel to a base channel set and that would still be a best practice. Um, however, ch uh, Content Lifecycle allows us to have multiple base channels uh, when we're building where we want updates to be pulled from. Once those are defined and uh, attached, as you see up in the screen, uh, to the project, then now that will be available for uh, those packages to be presented to our managed systems. So let's take a moment and talk about filters. Dario? Yeah, so um, the uh, what filter does and why it's there, um, uh, we, we said uh, you select some sources, uh, you have uh, your set of channels, uh, you have prepared your base channel and um, many different child channels, you have your set. Now uh, you want to customize it because you are going to uh, build and promote your, your set. Um, as a sources, but maybe you want to make sure that something will never get into your uh, customized set of sources, or maybe you want to make sure it, it will always be there even if you are filtering out be, be, uh, with some criteria. Uh, so you, you can uh, select uh, some criteria for packages or batches, and you can make sure uh, they will never or they will always be there. So let's let's see. Um, uh, let's say you you want to um, to remove uh, a specific package, and you can uh, filter it by name, or you can mention his name, epoch, version, release, and architecture, or maybe for patches you have uh, many other criteria like the, the name, the type, or some some more criteria. There is also um, another uh, type of filter, which is in the Next slide. Uh, that is um, uh, about filtering uh, the upstream sources of packages, which is uh, something specific for uh, Red 8 or CentO, uh, CentOS 8 channels. And in here, you can uh, you can easily uh, from the UI with some clicks, you can select the specific stream of uh, a specific uh, uh, source you you want to add instead of um, having the entire stream and it is uh, totally uh, useless in, in case you cannot select a specific uh, stream for uh, for packages sources. 
So, uh, for as an example, um, here uh, you you can see um, you can define a deny filter. Deny filter means uh, this kind of package uh, filtered by this criteria will never get into your uh, uh, your set and your source, um, your produced source. Um, and in this case, you can mention a specific name of package. Let's say you don't want any package that refer to uh, uh, Armageddon uh, as a no game filter. Or maybe uh, the other way around, you want to allow uh, a specific patch uh, or a specific type of patches to always get there. Maybe you are you are filtering with uh, some deny filter on patches, but you also want to make sure that even if you are uh, denying uh, some uh, some patches, you want to make sure uh, uh, a slice of them will always get uh, into into your sources. So. Um, you can uh, you can apply an allow filter where you say uh, all the latest uh, since this date uh, all the latest patches will go there and this is the exact reason of um, preparing um, more than one filters and uh, the combination of them uh, will make your sources customized as uh, as desired so uh, we have other uh, other examples, uh, for instance, uh, you can re you want to make sure that uh, your servers uh, are um, already installed. They have a, a kernel uh, package installed. You want to make sure they will never get um, uh, any kernel uh, update. So you don't want uh, in your source to to get other than um, a any other package with the kernel in its name, so you can filter it them out. Or uh, the, the the second example here, uh, you want to make sure all uh, patches that refers to a security patch, you want to make sure they will go in there. Maybe you are filtering out by a name, uh, a, a, a security patch of a kernel uh, from the filter before is filtered out um, with uh, with the allow filter for security updates, uh, you make sure uh, kernel updates for security reasons it would get there. And and uh, th those are uh, great examples because uh, I am currently working with a customer that has uh, specific uh, kernel modules to run specialized hardware uh, that are built against uh, uh, specific kernel versions, and so. Uh, well, we're doing exactly that, where we are not allowing kernel updates, but we still want to receive other updates, the security updates, uh, for the system to keep it secure, but we need to keep that hardware working. So this is a valuable feature for that. Yeah, and uh, in the end, the, the last, uh, as mentioned before, um, this is the example of how to create, to prepare a filter for um, upstream sources for uh, RHEL 8 and CentOS 8. Uh, here you can uh, specifically um, target um, um, a channel and a module and a stream. So uh, there are prepared uh, prepared fields to, to mention one, exactly the one you want, and you, you can decide to, to select the specific stream to for your sources. All right. So when we've defined our filters and we've assigned them to our environments, um, we are now ready to build out those environments. And so when we look at those environments being built, um, in this case we've defined one for dev, test, and prod. Um, those, uh, ch the source channel set will be now built into a dev channel set minus anything we've filtered. Um, or and specifically allowed whatever that criteria is and that's what constitutes our dev environment channel set uh, then that would be promoted through test and through prod now one of the things to notice on here is that auto incrementing of the version when we look at that version in this case uh, we have just version 3 2 and 1 so we've actually showed that we've we promoted patches two times more in ver in our dev environment than we have in our production. 
and just one time in in our test environment um, so that now you can clearly see um, what version each one of these environments are on uh, we see that also that we might have it might not just be version you know uh, three it, it might be version 50 in our dev we might be promoting multiple times into our dev environment um, before we get to uh, something that's stable to promote into test or user acceptance um, and then of course once it's been signed off on to promote into production so this is the feature of content lifecycle that really provides that stability that we talked about in uh, our environments so if we look at uh, this box here and what constitutes the uh, content lifecycle project uh, we defined our sources and our source channel set or sets uh, including the updates and and also uh, the filters um, within the user interface there's a build button that would actually take that source and build out this environment uh, that would build specifically our dev environment once that's built then we would promote into test and once again promote into prod and we would follow this life cycle for the life cycle or the duration of how often we promote patches and so once again when will it go to test well when you want it to go to test uh, based on when it's gone through change control uh, when uh, you're ready to actually run the testing same thing with production uh, it makes it quite uh, easy to uh, manage that now the advantage of this also is that um, by having this type of control that by the time you promote into production there should be very little risk content lifecycle should mitigate that risk by doing adequate testing in dev in dev and in our in your test environment and as far as the best practice if you did um, you know everything in dev and then you promote to test and then you find a problem that's where you would want to look at uh, your CICD, your, your continuous um, integration, your continuous uh, deployment practices, and find out why did you miss that in test. And go back to dev and look at what are your test cases, what's your test plan, and why you missed it so that the next time you don't miss it uh, before you promote into test. Because, and if you take that time to work on that, then promoting into production uh, will be a lot safer and a lot more stable and you'll have a lot less anxiety when going into production. All right, now let's talk about completing the solution. So content lifecycle and having that interface uh, does a lot of that heavy lifting for us as far as building out those channel sets and managing those and promoting through those. Um, but to complete the solution, we also need to have uh, activation keys and we need to have bootstrap scripts so that we can actually uh, register these systems into SUSE manager into the correct environments or the correct environments of those channel sets so once we've got that built out then we would create our activation key so for dev I would create a dev activation key and remember that would actually be dev for example slash 15 SP1 um, and then I would want to have a bootstrap script that would use that activation key. So now when I go to my systems in the dev environment, I would use that dev bootstrap script to register those systems into SUSE manager that would automatically use or that would use that dev key that would map it to the dev channel set. And now those systems from, from that point on, their repositories from the managed system perspective would have all of the dev updates. Likewise with test and prod, they would have the repositories locally defined based on what was defined in our content lifecycle within SUSE Manager. So now I want to take some time and actually uh, do a demo and actually show you what this looks like through the interface. Okay, let's look at content lifecycle manager inside SUSE Manager. So I'm going to sign in. And then in the left column, I will go down to Content Lifecycle. Now within Content Lifecycle, that's where we see the projects that we've defined. And I've got one defined here for 
slash 15 SP1. And as I look at this project, we see the different components. So first of all, I see the project properties that are here. So pretty much I can change the name or description if I need to once it's created. Uh, then we go down to the sources. Within the sources, we see where we can attach or detach sources to the specific content lifecycle project. You see in here I've attached less 15 SP1. Any additionals, I would just click the attach button there. Now, also in this project, I've got filters defined. Uh, this filter is basically said that I want everything from Q1. So uh, in in here, we're going to say that everything from that's equal to or greater or later than April 1st will not be allowed to be promoted. So maybe in our scenario, we're a quarter behind in our updates. So that gives us time uh, for the things to be tested before deployed. So you can see it's very easy, easy to uh, add filters. And if I had additional fil filters, once again, I could attach those by clicking that button. Now we see in here that we have a build button. And the build button has a number one in parentheses, indicating that there are one changes to our project that will be applied when we click that build button. When we go back up and look at the project itself, we see that there is a version history. So we see the last one that was deployed was version six. Version seven, we've updated, but you see it has not been built yet. And that is indicated by the number one in the button. So once we press that button, it will ask us to uh, give information. We can give some type of information. A lot of times, I just like to give the date. Something like that, and then I'll hit build. Okay, now we see that uh, the channels are being cloned and being built into this channel set with that filter applied. Once that's done, then all of my systems that are subscribing to my dev environment will now receive those updates and have uh, them available to be installed. We also see that we have a test and a production environment. Notice the version that they are on. We see here that this is version seven that's being applied. If we look at our test environment, it's still on version five, so um, which is what we'd expect it to be a little bit behind. And then we see our production is on version two. So you can kind of see why I put the date in there because the date allows me to see uh, specifically when that version was created. Now, what is this content lifecycle project doing? Well, if we go and look at the software channel configuration, we see that we have three new channel sets. Okay, They are now all prefixed with the content lifecycle name. That's why when I said we might want to keep that to somewhat of a small name, uh, it's important for that. There are limitations on the size of the name. I believe it's 64 characters or something like that. Um, it will let you know uh, when you're working with it what that limitation is. So, so just be aware of that. Um, but the naming convention is that we have the content lifecycle name, we have the environment name, and then we have the distribution name. And so if I expand that, we see that not only does the base channel have that name, but each of the child channels within that channel set have that same naming convention. So in summary, I have three new channel sets with patches at different patch levels for each one of my environments of dev, test, and prod. Now to use these, that's where I can go in and I would want to define activation keys. And notice that I now have an activation key for dev, prod, and test. And so when I bootstrap those systems, they will each uh, use that activation key, which will assign those channel sets to each one of those. Now, I have done that. So when now when I go to my system list, notice that server one is using the production channel set. Server two is using the test channel set, and three is using the dev channel set. In other words, three, or the dev channel set, is the most current. Uh, I've introduced the latest patches in there, could, could possibly be the most unstable, um, where production is going to be the most stable. 
So that's kind of an overview of what content lifecycle management is within SUSE Manager. Okay, so now that we've uh, looked at the user interface, let's talk about some of the use cases and some real world examples. Um, we've looked at by environment, right? And your environments might be different than dev test. It might be user acceptance. It might be pre-production. Um, what, whatever works in your environment, you have that control of defining those environments uh, within your enterprise. Um, we also see it in SAP environments. And a lot of times it is by the SAP landscapes uh, for whatever, whatever has been defined in those landscapes, whether it starts with a sandbox and, you know, the development and so forth. Um, and what's interesting is the stability that's provided by content lifecycle is so valuable that even though many environments might only have a few SAP systems that are very large usually, but even though they have a few systems, um, the investment in SUSE Manager and defining these uh, life cycles with content life cycle provides such stability that it, it's worth the investment. So many times we see SUSE Manager managing uh, thousands of systems, um, but sometimes we see SUSE Manager managing a couple of dozen systems uh, that are very large with SAP just so that it can provide that stability. Another use case might be function or role, uh, where we might see that, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, a web farm uh, for a, a content provider, that might get updated on a daily basis. Um, there might be other systems, uh, you know, uh, business intelligence systems, uh, business logic systems that uh, maybe are not updated as often. So we might have different... Uh, channel sets uh, for that and how that they get promoted. Uh, another example is uh, a lot of times retailers, um, when they're running SUSE Linux on their point of service devices or their cash registers, that in those environments, they are only uh, updating those as needed because um, they usually, you know, deploy them, keep them going and they're working and only when there's a, a critical security fix or a, a major feature do they update those. So uh, it could, uh, by function, by role is, is another common uh, use case that we see with this. The other might be schedule. Um, we do see some that uh, have some systems that they uh, update quarterly. Other systems update, are updated monthly. Um, so it could be uh, schedule in how those things are promoted. Content lifecycle gives you that ability uh, to control that uh, in your environment. Now, um, Dario, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, um, just uh, about how it works uh, under the hood, actually. The, the content lifecycle, uh, for who is uh, uh, familiar with SUSE Manager, in the end, content lifecycle just clones channels under the hood. It, uh, it, it manages, uh, it, it lets you go through a nice UI to clone a set of channels and promote them. So clone clones again, channels, clones of clones, and, um, and keep their, their content up to date with, uh, with your uh, specific filters that customize the, the content exactly the content of, uh, of this life cycle of channels. So uh, under the hood is uh, an, a nice interface to, to do what uh, it was able to do before by the command line, but just uh, one channel by one. And, and so this is uh, much, uh, much more e usable and uh, easy to, to create a customized set of channels. Absolutely, and if uh, if anyone's ever had to do this in SUSE Manager 3, um, you did spend a lot of time at the command line or uh, calling the API and building scripts to uh, to manage this on a regular basis. Um, now with it all in the uh, web interface, it does make it much easier to uh, deal with those clones and how they work. Well, we appreciate your time. We hope that this has been valuable for you. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of uh, SUSECON Digital. Thank you. Thank you.